Are we on? All right, let's get started. We're going to spend about 35 minutes going really, really fast. Are you guys okay with that? Yeah. Everybody tells me I talk way too fast, but I'll tell you, it's really the Germans that complain. They're like, I can't understand English that fast. But I know you guys, I've been now three years to Barcelona to talk to all you guys, and you guys can listen really fast. So we're going to move really fast. I have a lot of really cool things to show you. I'm going to try some really dangerous demonstrations live here on stage, and we'll see what blows up for me. Maybe it'll all work, maybe it won't, but we're going to have some fun with that. But I'm going to talk to you about some things that are very important. And if you remember, th uh, three years ago, or actually 2017, I actually came and did a presentation about Java and Docker, and it was called Java Docker Fail. Does anyone remember that presentation? Anybody? Okay, fantastic. Well, we're, gonna, we're not going to recap that one, but I have some imagery from that uh, specific point. You know, I was very, the first time I was in Barcelona, and I was very excited to be here. You have such a beautiful city, and I've now been several times since then, and I was very excited to be here. And you guys, are, of course, have a great football, right, soccer kind of history here. And I am actually a big-time soccer fan, a big-time football fan. I coached soccer for 14 years. For, for lo small, little, tiny children all the way up to age 18, traveled around all over the southeast United States, so I've always been a big fan of football, or soccer as we call it in America. So that was very big for me, so I really enjoyed that. So it was nice to kind of come here to Barcelona and, you know, in Spain where football really matters. And I really love the fact that you guys are also a port city, a container city. You guys realize that, right? So you have all these container ships you see going up down the coastline, dropping containers off at this, at this port. And that's kind of the point behind Linux containers. You can basically put anything in those shipping containers. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be cars. It could be toys. It could be drugs. You know, we don't know what it might be. But you can move them all around the world because the container is uniform. That's the beautiful thing of the shipping container. And we showed you how do we put Java in a nice Linux container and then, of course, what it might mean to actually deal with that. And, of course, by default, Java blows up, right? So that's what I showed you. If you don't take care of Java properly, it just default dies. The nice thing is with Kubernetes, it restarts it automatically. So that was my present two years ago. So I just kind of want to mention that again because we're going to talk about that same key point. We've been thinking about this problem for some time. So when you think about that shipping container, and I have the little Docker logo there where you might do a Docker build or Docker run to put that actual container together, you know, you, have to do, you do have to take care of it, all right? You have to treat it a special way. It's still Linux. And if you put Java inside that container, it might look something like this, right? We're taking our Java application, we're putting it in there, and then we're going to actually put these constraints on it, these resource limitations. We're going to lock it down. And the problem with locking it down, that's when it blows up. Because by default, Java's like, wait a second, I see the whole computer. I see everything here. I see all the CPUs. I see all the memory. I should be able to use all that hardware when the Linux container has actually shrunk it down to a little tiny sliver of CPUs and memory. And now that has been corrected with Java 11. It's actually fixed in later versions of Java 8. Depending on where you get your Java from, it may have already been fixed. But do keep in mind that out of the box, it will blow up. OK? So we want to make Duke here happy, make sure that he's playing soccer happily on the beach here in Barcelona. So I want you guys to think about that, because that's what we're going to solve here in this next few minutes. We're going to address that key point. OK. Now, here's one thing I know about all of you folks here in this room right now. You guys need to understand that you are the digital creators of the future. We live in a new digital economy. We live in a new digital age. There are 10 billion, no, actually, there's only about 6 to 7 billion people on this planet, but there are 10 million professional software developers. Think about that for one second. 6 to 7 billion people need what you have. You have a skill that they do not have, but they need your digital applications, your APIs, your digital videos, your digital music, everything that you create as a digital creator, they wish to consume. And there's only 10 million professional software developers. But to put that in greater context, look around this room right now. There's, what, 600 of us in this room? So just a tiny fraction of Java developers actually come to their local meetup, show up for the local Java user group, show up for the local conference. So you are already the elite of the elite. You're incredibly special because you're investing your time, your energy, to come out and learn new things. So I want to be very mindful of your time, and I, very, I appreciate you come here and listen to me, because I'm going to hopefully show you something that gives you a new superpower, something that, gives you, that enables you to do something you couldn't do before. And that's what I'll try to do here in the next several minutes. But you are the very few of the people on the planet who can do what we're about to do here in, in this presentation. Also, this quote here I like to use because this is actually a quote or a survey done by IT executives. And they found that, you know, they say that only 11% of the people in their organizations probably have the skills to actually do what we need to do doing in the future, right? In other words, this digital economy is going to be built on people like yourself, and we're in the 
Okay, so this is within IT professionals. Maybe 11% of IT professionals can actually do what needs to be done here. So I like to think of this as a Darwinian world. There's this evolutionary path that you're on. And you've seen me use these kinds of diagrams before. I've actually got a lot of cool ones here. This is my teaching elephants version of it, right? You've got to think about DevOps. You've got to think about your self-service on-demand elastic infrastructure. You've got to think about CI, CD, and deployment techniques and all that fancy stuff. And I can spend an hour or two on each of these topics, and I have in many different presentations. We certainly can't do that now, but I do like thinking of it in different ways, right? There's my elephant version of it, but there's also my Wonder Woman version of it. Or maybe, better yet, okay? There's, you guys like this one, you guys want to take photos of it. But we gotta keep moving. There's also the Bruce Lee version of it, because I've this is a key theme that I've been thinking about for many, many years now. How do we keep addressing these key points? How do we evolve along this path? So I want you guys thinking about that as well as we get into this presentation, all right? I like Bruce Lee as well, okay. So I want to take you back to 1999. I want to give you a little history lesson. Not like the amazing history lesson you just heard about the Apollo missions, because that was absolutely amazing, inventing software and hardware technology that we all leverage today. But I want you to go back to 1999 for just a few seconds. And that'll give you a little additional context for what we're about to tell you. This is, was the big movie in 1999, at least for me. If you remember that opening scene where Trinity basically spun around in the room and kicked that police officer, I was blown away. That was amazing. Right? They invented new technology to show us a new type of cinematography, and we were just blown away by The Matrix in general. Of course, it's just a great movie. And also, these were the big songs back in 1999. You remember these? TLC, come on now. You gotta love TLC and Cher, I know. She was a little bit older at that time, right? She was only like 80, and now she still, she still looks awesome at age 100 or whatever she might be, right? But, you know, it was big back then. And you might remember this too. This was a very proud moment for me as American. We won the World Cup. Who, who remembers that? We totally won the World Cup. The Americans won the World Cup. You guys don't remember? Wow. Wow. And, and, you know, and this is a, a football-loving country, I thought. Okay? You might have forgotten that we did win the World Cup. And I want you to think about what I just showed you right there. You didn't even know what I was talking about because you assume only men can play soccer. So that is a bias you have built into your brain that you have to overcome at some point in the future. All right? And the weird part is, I've showed this to a lot of audiences at this point, all throughout Europe. And even the women in the audience come up and go, oh, yeah. The ladies play soccer, too. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you got to keep that in mind, right? It's not, this is just a universal thing. But this was a very proud moment. And again, when I said I coached for 14 years, I coached girls primarily. And I got to tell you, the ladies team that I coached could destroy any group of 11 in this room right now. They would tear you up. Okay, my daughter still plays to this day. But the reason I want to take you back to 1999 is if you were building software and actually deploying it into the cloud at that point in time, there was no cloud, right? You were deploying it into your own set of servers, your own data center, right? You actually spent half a million dollars to do Hello World. It was half a million dollars to get started as a Java application developer, to basically stand up enough hardware, get the licensing for the software you needed, because everything was closed source back then. There was no open source of significance back then. Okay, so you had to buy these Sun Solaris boxes, and they were built like this, if you remember. They looked like little washing machines. Okay, they were actually really big things. And I remember this, because IT de uh, department managers would take me into their data center and say, look at this cool computer we bought. And I would always ask, well, what are you doing for your developers to enable them to actually write code for these cool computers? And I'm like, oh, don't worry about developers, right? But we got cool hardware. And then you would also spend huge money on things like your IDE. You used to have to spend tons of money to get Semantic Cafe or another IDE at that point in time. So not only do you spend close to $463,000 you know, from your capital expenditure, you also then had to spend another 80000 a year on maintenance. You know, to keep those IDEs alive, to keep those Sun and Solaris boxes alive. So it was a huge deal, if you think about it from that point in time. Okay? And the world has changed dramatically. Mm. It's changed so dramatically that now in the world of the cloud, we don't think in terms of spending half a million dollars to get started. We don't spend half a million dollars for Hello World. We spend about two cents. We can spin up a whole series of computers bigger than those that we sh I just showed you, right? With more CPUs, more, uh, more memory, over in one of these public cloud providers, and I'm just kind of list different options here, right? It, with two cents, five cents, 25 cents, I can get started. It is that kind of money now. The world has changed dramatically. And the reason I make this point is now what we're going to talk about is how Java has to evolve to live in this new world, okay? And what we've done with it. So if you look at my chart here, this is a little bit of a history lesson. You can see Java born in 1996 there. But look at Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Or actually, it's not even Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Red Hat Linux in 2000. So Linux for the enterprise was born well after Java. 
okay? Look at all these other things you might see here. Agile, DevOps, the cloud, 2006 with EC2 and S3, or at Amazon, okay? So, you know, if you look at things like Vertex and Drop Wizard, which gave us the concept of the fat jar, even back in 2012, we came up with these concepts from Netflix, which showed us how to do distributed computing. We now call microservices with Eureka and Ribbon and, you know, things like that. So the world, again, has changed a lot over the course of this history. And if you look over here in 2014, 2013, right, Docker was born, Spring Boot was born, Kubernetes was born. And so we've been thinking about these problems for quite some time. But you have to kind of think of Java in this context. It was kind of before all of this, and things have changed. The Linux container in Linux itself came after Java. All right? Now, I make this point because if you think about it from a 2015 standpoint, we were working on Kubernetes. Red Hat was working on Kubernetes from the very beginning. And we actually, this is a demonstration. You can go look on YouTube if you want to kind of prove me wrong if you like. But we decided to show this in a significant way. We launched 1,000 containers live on stage for an audience at, at Red Hat Summit one year. So in other words, we want to show these new things called Linux containers are incredibly lightweight. But you can still manage them at scales after one big, large computer. Let's show how we can launch them in two and a half minutes. 1,026 containers in two and a half minutes. It blew people's minds. And then we actually put a little application workload in each one of them. So every one of those little containers that was born was a new web application server. And in order to make that scale work, and I was very much a part of this, we had to do it with Node.js. Java was too fat and slow. There was no way in hell to do that with Java, right? We did it with Node.js to make that level scale work. And so as a Java person, as a Java champion, as a Java user group leader, right, as someone who's been part of the Java community for 20 plus years, it did hurt my feelings a little bit, but we had to do it. And so I've been thinking about this for many, many years now. We've been thinking about this problem. So I want to talk to you about this, uh, this thing called Quarkus, right? Supersonic subatomic Java. It was actually a tagline that I came up with for the team. That was my great contribution was the tagline, OK? I didn't have anything to do with the actual creation of the technology. We have geniuses working for Red Hat to actually build all this stuff. And so the one thing I always like to make point here, my wife did a great job, by the way, with the Mark Twain Duke. You guys know Mark Twain, right? <laughs> the, the reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. And because we've been talking about Java as being a problem for a long time. This actual quote from 2006. Java's, a, you know, Java's this, Java's that. And here's what's crazy. When we introduced Quarkus to the market back in March, you can actually go find the Reddit thread where there's a guy debating with me on the internet, like internet people do, about why in the world would you guys at Red Hat make any investment in Java whatsoever? Java's dead. Right? You just hear that time and time again. And I've actually had lots of conversations with customers before we made this announcement who were like, you know what, Java's so fat and slow, we're moving to Node.js. All my developers are being retrained on Node.js. And I actually just talked to one gentleman who was, he just saw the presentation, and when I left the stage and showed him Quarkus and left the stage, he walked up and he goes, I was about to retrain 300 developers on Go starting next week. I'm stopping that training right now because it looks like we can still use Java going forward. So that is a specific issue I want you guys to be thinking about. We've been thinking about it for quite some time because Java is an incredibly important language in our ecosystem. Java continues to be, if not number one, number two in all the different rankings that you see. So Java ought to be viable in this cloud-native world, and that was kind of a key point for us. So Java still has so much goodness in its ecosystem. It has still, still so many frameworks, right? Still so many cool tools and utilities and things we want to use. We want to leverage those capabilities in our new Java-based applications we just had to figure out how to make Java fast and small. That was really the kind of the key point, OK? Because really, if you think about it, with Java, it's not JVM itself and Java itself, the Java programming languages, is actually not fat and slow. It's actually all the frameworks we've added on top. All the frameworks took full advantage of that dynamic class loading. All the frameworks took advantage of that dynamic, you know, let's scan everything in the class path for annotations, and let's create all these artifacts in memory, right? And that includes things like Hibernate, as a good example, which comes from the Red Hat team. So we did all these things, and Java gets a little bit chubby, OK? And when you put Java in the container again and uh, scale it back down and say, look, we need you to live in this Linux container concept again, it blows up. And that was a problem. So that's what we had to address, OK? So think of it like this. What happens if you put Java in all these little containers? Can you make them happy in there? Can you make it successful? And so that's what we do with Quarkus, this technology that we just open sourced just a couple months ago. It's at 0 0.15 as of this morning that I last looked. So it's still not even 1.0 yet, but you guys should keep that in mind. So Quarkus is going to help us build smaller, faster Java applications. And I want to show you that. OK, I want to move it. I want to move rather fast here and show you some of this before we run out of time. So we're going to try something a little bit crazy. We're going to actually build an application. Well, at least part of an application as fast as we can go. 
What we're going to do is say MK dir BCN. How about that? BC, we're going to change into that directory, BCN. And now it's just an empty directory, right? There's nothing here. But now let me actually do, let me add something here. I'm going to actually go to the uh, Quarkus.io website. You can see it right here. And I'm going to just copy this little line out. And it's just a Maven plugin that allows me to generate an application. So I'm going to just copy and paste that in. And I'm going to just build a standard little application. Let's call it Comber Sutter BCN. And we're going to call this the BCN project and 1.0 snapshot. Yeah, give me a rest endpoint. We'll call it that. We'll call it that. That's fantastic. OK, that's not bad so far. Now I have some artifacts here. Let me bring up my programming editor. I love Visual Studio. Uh, Visual Studio Code is actually called. And uh, let me pull it up and just show you one thing real fast. It actually is something we worked on with Microsoft. So the Java support for this came from Red Hat originally. So there's 17 million downloads of Java support for Visual Studio Code. It is by far and away my editor, favorite editor at this point in time. Uh, let's go back over here, though, and show you the code. Bah, bah, bah. Here we go. And so here's our application in Java. And this is just a, a, simple, a simple endpoint, right? It says hello. But what I want to do right now, and actually, let's do this. I'm actually going to just come over here now and say another, take advantage of another, uh, another feature of the plugin, and that is I'm going to basically say Maven Quarkus Dev. So this basically says run the Java application, an enterprise style Java application, throw it into development mode, Let, run the debugger. So there I am running it. And actually, if I come over here now and say localhost 8080, all right, and then go to the hello endpoint. OK, there we go. All right, so hello. And now I can make it say, let's make it say something else. Bonjour. All right, hit refresh. And here's kind of the point of this. You have this nice edit, save, refresh programming model. Now, for some of you might be thinking, well, I don't know. I like the Maven build, right? I like a nice long build so I can go get coffee. <laughs> but this is how Node.js developers work, all right? So this is, if you're a Node programmer, you're like, that's the way it should work. That's the way it always works. Not for us Java people. This is kind of new, OK? This is a new thing. I can go in here and just make changes now to my application. And actually, let's not do bonjour. Let's do hola, right? We've got to get that right here. And you know, hit refresh. All I do is hit save, refresh. Edit, save, refresh. Edit, save, refresh. So that's already one dramatic change that if, you know, if all that's what we did, that would be pretty interesting all by itself. Because it used to be you could buy special technology, you know, things like JRebel and things like that, to give you this capability. But in this case, it's kind of out of the box. So don't think about it. But let's go and build something more real. Let's kind of have a real application. So I'm going to say more uh, Maven Quarkus list extensions. Uh, let's spell extensions correctly. Let's see if I did that right. All right, very good. I'm going to add some extensions now. So an extension, think of this as a jar file on my POM XML. But these extensions have been, uh, have been specially adjusted to be ready to compile down to native code. In other words, they're, they're all the things you're used to, all right? Like I want a Postgres SQL for JDBC. I want, let's say, um, what else do we have here? Oh, I want to get the Panache. Uh, this is actually a new library called Panache. And I'm going to add that one. So it's Hibernate, but it's basically Hibernate made easy. So we're going to have Hibernate there. And of course, like I said, the Hibernate team works with Red Hat. The Camel team works with Red Hat. What else do we want here? Uh, oh, I want to get JSONB. Yep, because we're going to serialize objects to JSON. So let me get those three things in there and hit Return. And that's going to update my POM XML. Let me open up my editor again. Dun, dun, dun. And it's going to basically say, hey, you've updated your POM XML. Would you like to import that? Yes, I would. So you can see there's my POM XML update. So now I've got what I need to actually now build a real application. OK, so I need to build a real application. But first thing I want to do is actually build a database. We've got to talk to a database. I'm going to come over here and talk to my, uh, we're going to talk to Postgres. So BCN here. And actually, let's just call this my BCN. It makes it a little bit easier for me to remember. And then we want a password. We need to give this some, uh, this is the user, by the way. So the user that can actually create the database. So let's come over here and create the database and do that. And we'll just map that there. That looks all good. I think I did all that right. All right, fantastic. So we have, a, we have an empty database right now to basically store our application in. So the doo -doo -doo, yeah, looks good. No tables. Yeah, no tables right now. See, that's empty, the table section. We don't have any tables. Let me make sure I bring up my dev mode again. Don't forget that. Because now I can actually still continue working on this application. I can come over here now. And again, if I want to change this, I could, right? So let's go, hola mundo, hello. Hello, world. Uh, let's check that out. Refresh. 
All right, very good. All right, so we're still good. But now I want to do something kind of more enterprisey, right? As an average application developer, you're going to build an application that might look something like this. I'm going to have a little to-do application. And this is going to be a class, so let's do that. And what I want is it, this to be an entity, OK? So you guys are familiar with JPA. That shouldn't be a problem. But what we're going to do that's a little bit different is extends Panache Entity. So this gives me some special capabilities. Again, Panache is Hibernate, but Hibernate made easy. All right, just think of it like that. So let me go ahead and declare some values here. Uh, the title, let's go with the public, and then we'll do a Boolean. Let's spell Boolean correctly. Completed, and then we're going to go public uh, int order. And actually, order is one of those words that often causes databases some havoc. So let's go ahead and change the name. So let's go in here and say name equal order ring. OK, I think I did that right. Let's go check out. Let me see if my app is still up and running. Yeah, it still says, oh, I got an error there. Threw an exception. I did something wrong. But here's one thing nice that's about this, OK? You can say, wait a second, we don't have a data, we don't have a JDBC driver here. So we actually will throw errors into the browser. Again, if you're a Node.js person, you're like, oh, yeah, this kind of works normally. As a Java person, you're like, wait a second, that's kind of different. And so, all right, all right, I need to fix that. I forgot something. I literally forgot something. I forgot to actually come over here and paste in my application property so it knows how to connect to the database. So let's go over here and let's do that. OK, let's put those in. And, let's, and then we, should, we call this BCN. All right, and my user ID and password was BCN. All right, so let's get that right. I think I did that right now. Let's see here. Let's try to our edit, save, refresh again. OK, well, it looks like our application is running now happily. Let's go check out our tables. Let's go see here, and now we have the to-do table. So the schema is gener generated for me automatically. And you're probably thinking, oh my god, that's kind of amazing, but that's actually a Hibernate feature. It's just that Panache makes Hibernate easy. Now, everything in this new world basically has one single application properties file. You don't have to have 15 of them anymore. One place to pull all that information. That looks, that's pretty straightforward. But now I need to kind of do something with this application. All right, so we have our entity. Let's add an endpoint for it. So let's call it to-do resource.java. OK, I'm almost going to run out of time here. I'm going to have to move a little faster. Is that OK? Uh, let's see here. Uh, then we're going to basically say at path, because this is going to be a REST endpoint. We're going to put that on the root, and at produces. And let's get the media type here. Dun, 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 dun. Application JSON. That's what we want. And oh, we got to get our path imported there. Come on there. Here we go. Import. There we go. All right. And let's just do this to make it easier as we go forward. OK, we got that. And oh, I need to also consume. I want to consume. And we'll just copy and paste this application type here also. OK, the first thing I want to do is with my new REST endpoint, my JAXRS endpoint, I want to say at get uh, public, blah, blah, public, and we want to return a list. Yeah, let's return a list of to dos. And then I can say get all, give it a name. And let's see, all right. OK, so we got to get our list imported here as well. Yeah, we want the Java Util list. Fantastic. And now we want to do this, return uh, to do list all. So the nice thing is there's a convenience method. So again, Panache is making those things easy. Find by ID. Give me a list of these things. All right, let's, you know, again, it's Hibernate. But it's just Hibernate made easy. So let, we go in there, hit return, hit save. All right, good. Notice I put it on the root. Mm, let's see what happens when I go here. Oh, OK, so I have this web page. And out of the box, we give you this web page. So I just want to make you guys aware of it, because this might throw you off. Like, wait a second, where'd this come from? And it actually is out there in the system. So let me open up my, I'm going to open up Finder, just to kind of show you what this looks like. Where'd Finder go? There, not there. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, I'm in the wrong directory. Open up Finder. Yeah, there we go. So I just did this thing called BCN. So if we look over here at source, all right, main resources, uh, meta resources, there's the index HTML. So we don't want that one. Let's just remove that one. OK, so that'll get rid of that. And then our app is basically loading an empty JSON array right now, because there's no data in our database. But at least it actually connected to the database. Everything works. Schema's all generated. Let me add a, the user interface, though. So there's a user interface all in open source called to-do MVC. That's why this to-do schema is kind of nice, because there's already a great UI for it. I'm just going to grab that, because you know, I get cloned it off the internet. So it should be great, right? You know, well, let's try that. Let's try that. Paste it in here. And OK, looks good. Looks like it pasted in. So I can come in now and basically interact with this application, right? So there's nothing behind it right now. 
But if there was anything in the database, it would actually load in. So let's actually add at least one more endpoint, and then we'll show you some other things. OK, so that is my get. Oh, let's move that down there. Let's do a post. Uh, there we go, post. And for post, we want to make it transactional, because we definitely need transaction support. And then I want to do something like this, public uh, response, add one, to do item. All right, dun, dun, dun. let's do that. And we got a response. Let's make sure response is imported correctly. Let's see. Yep, it's that RS core one. Fantastic. And then we, now we want to do a item dot persist. So I can persist the to do item that came in from a JSON. Again, JSON, JSON B came in as a serialized blob. And then I can return my response because in order you should respond nicely. So response. Uh, dun, dun. And we want to do a status. Yes, we're going to do a status. And we're going to do an item. We're going to send that back. Uh, and OK. Oh, actually, wait. I got this backwards, right? Status. And we, and we want this to be a 201. Moving too fast now. I can't even think straight. Let's see. Did I do that right? All right. Again, if you notice, I'm just editing. I'm hitting Save. I'm hitting Refresh. And uh, let's see. One, two, three. Let's go check that out. Did that actually hit my database? And Refresh. And let's go look. Let's check it out. And I like looking in the database to see if, in fact, my data made it. Made it. So right. So we're my data made it in there. So I have one, two, three. So we, we're building a whole application now. I'm not going to finish this application because we won't have a lot of time. But what I want to do now is show you one thing. It is a real application, right? So with API making an impact to the database, that's setting up the connection pool and everything else, right? So we have our schema. But let's go ahead and package it up, okay? And the one thing I'll show you is this thing called the native. And it does actually take a few seconds to run. I'm going to let it run here in the background. And we're going to show you something else. But what I'm doing now is I'm compiling that application now to a native executable. Oh, and I have a test failure. Because remember, I changed it from hello to hola mundo. So let's just skip test for now. I forgot about that one. But I want to show you one other thing here, right? Uh, to do, to, to, no, not that one. To do, oh, Quarkus to do. I want to do something else. So let that run in the background. Let's make these windows, make it a little bit easier to see here. OK? And what I want to do is, oops, to this kubectl, get pods. We make a big point out of why you do want faster and slower, at least I try to make a big point, is because it makes it so you can scale things easier. So I already have that to-do application running with a Postgres backend, running up at a Kubernetes cluster in the cloud. You guys could actually, if you knew the URL, you could go see it right now. So that's the same to-do application that I was just live coding on there. But what I want to show you is something like this. So I can basically say, let's pull it. And I have an endpoint that basically says, uh, what is the, you can see it says host, and it says, what is the host name? The host name is the same as the pod identifier. Because in Java, or Node.js, or Python, or, or doesn't matter what it is, it sees that Linux container as its host. It doesn't know there's a computer beyond that computer. It thinks the Linux container is its computer. And so that's an important thing to understand. But I can then now do things like roll things out. I want to roll out version 3 of this application. So watch what happens in my lower window here. It's deploying now version 3. You can see it's going through that process, right? There's still version, the version 2 that's actually running. Version 3 is coming online, and now version 3 is ready. And so that concept of a fast deployment is important. So you can see it says version 3 now. So again, smaller, faster matters in this cloud-native architecture where I want to basically practice CI, CD. I want to deploy all the time. I want to make changes all the time. If I decide, oh, crap, I don't want that version, I want to roll back, it's easy to do that as well. I can roll back to version 2. You can see the rolling update taking effect in the lower right-hand corner there. It's going back to version 2 now. So something as simple as that might be all you want in this new world of having a really fast, small Java. So it can easily roll out new versions, as an example. And so there we go. Let's try the polar here again. Uh, make sure my curl connects. And so I'm back on version 2. So that's an example of a blue-green deployment. Right? You may have heard the expression blue-green deployment. That's a super simple example of that. And you kind of see what that looks like. But I want to show you something else. Let's kind of show you something a little bit more complicated than that. I'm going to switch projects over here. Uh, let's see, OC project side by side. And we're going to do watch, Q control, get pods. OK. All right, so we have no pods running in this project, or in this namespace. But what I want to do now is show you this. I'm going to come over here now and basically send in a bunch of load into this system. This is using something called Knative. So Knative is a serverless architecture on top of Kubernetes. When I hit it with too much load, it'll dynamically auto-scale out. 
Okay, so you can see my Quarkus-based applications are now coming online. So that's a Java-based application that's basically responding in real time, throwing up four different application servers in real time based on the load. You can see it basically had 40 concurrent hits. It had four simultaneous users. So therefore, it thought, oh, at this moment, this huge burst of load is coming in. I'm going to scale out. And you can see it did that about 13 seconds. And then I can come over here and basically run my little polar, and I can just knock up against it. So basically, I'm just hitting that Quarkus-based application now. But watch, I'll do the same thing in Node.js. OK, well, not the polar. Let's also overwhelm it with load. It'll do the same thing. OK, but while that's occurring, let me come over here and check this out. OK, those are my node, these are my Quarkus-based pods that just came online. You can see there are 6 megs of RAM right now. So if you kind of watch it, you'll see that it kind of evens out. And you'll also notice that because this is Knative, it'll also downscale the application in real time based on need. But you can kind of see my Quarkus app is up and running. My Node.js app is out and up and running. It took a little bit longer, but that's OK, right? So it's no, no problem that Node.js is a little bit slower. Not a problem there. But let me do this. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Let me go over here and pull against Node.js. So again, I'm going to knock up against Node.js. And if you watch carefully, I'm basically just monitoring container memory here. So this is my. Uh, this is my Node.js application, close to 30 megabytes of RAM. And this is my Java application, close to, uh, what, 9 megs of RAM? So, in, so the point of this is, Java starts faster than Node now, right? And Java is half the size of Node in this case. Now, that's not always going to be true, right? I've also done other things in my application to make Java almost as big as Node.js. But think about that for a moment. This kind of performance is game changing for what you need to do in your cloud native application architecture. In this situation, if you can start Java that fast, if you can basically make Java run in that small of a memory footprint for a regular enterprise application like you would normally build every day anyway, you don't have to go to Node to get the additional performance. You don't even have to go to Go to get the additional performance that you need in an architecture where you want this dynamic scale, where you want this ability to load and reload applications on the fly. So I could, you know, we could sit here and kind of play with this and watch these Node.js Node applications. Yeah, that's Node, right? Down here is Quarkus. So it's, you know, substantial performance improvement for the same application. It's all it's doing in this case is Hello World. But let's actually check out our to-do application. It did finish building over here. OK, so let's come over here now and let's do an LA. So this, it basically creates the native executable. This is using Growl VM, Growl VM, if you're familiar with that, to create a native image, to create a native executable for this application. So if I come over here and say uh, LH, OK, here is the application right here. It's 55 megs. And that is the entire Java-based application in a native binary, a native executable for the Mac OS in this case. OK, you can also build one for Linux. And that's actually what I was using over here for this little application. But let's watch this. So this is my native application running right now. And so let's do, or sorry, let's run our native application. Watch closely, because it starts in 0.15 seconds. Actually, that was a little slow. I might have a lot of things happening on this computer. Let's see. Uh, let's, no, let's try it again. OK. Oh, it seems about 0.15. But keep in mind, this is actually connecting to the database. Let me go hit refresh here. Uh, two. So this is the same application. And you can see I misspelled, you know, learn uh, Quarkus. Love Java. All right. Let me come over here and check out my to-dos again. And let's see if my data. Uh, there it is, in my database. So keep, think of what happened there in less than a second. It, it started the application, including what we think of as a Java application. It connected to the database, set up all the frameworks, set up a connection pool, generated the schema, and it's ready for a first request in that amount of time. So this is not one of those lazily loaded things where you basically are waiting for the application frameworks and all those components to come to life. This is meaning I'm a ready-to-serve request. And in this dynamically high-scale architecture where you're dealing with a Kubernetes or a cloud-native architecture, you have to respond quickly. OK? So that's a key element to understand there. And you can see there it is. Uh, that's my simple application. And I can also come back over here and look at this little guy. If I want, I can come over here and check out its performance characteristics again. Yep, so there we go. Node.js clocking in there. Right? So it, that's just kind of fun to watch. If you've ever been a Node person and a Java person, you're like, how is that even possible? Java's smaller than Node.js. I'm totally out of time, though, so let me go and wrap things up. We have a little bit more in this presentation, but we'll just kind of skip through it real fast. OK? 
So think about it, the live reload, the ability to build serverless style or microservice applications. Again, it's optimized for your enterprise style use cases. You can build a fat jar with regular JVM style hotspot if you want. That's still smaller and faster than what you normally had on a JVM because we've optimized the frameworks to work in this new world, this cloud native world. And so just think about that. If you want to run on the JVM, you can. Then there's nothing wrong with that. And actually, most of our customers will probably run that way. But if you want to go all the way down to a native executable, you can also do that as well and make it incredibly tight. So also, we have already started making these libraries work within this new world. So Apache Camel, if you're doing any form of enterprise inter integration patterns, you know, InfiniSpan for a distributed data cache. Of course, it all runs on Kubernetes and OpenShift, which is what I was just showing you there. So we're going to continue expanding this list. And there's actually a lot, much longer list than this. You saw it when I did the list extensions. We are focusing on this Kubernetes native architecture pro from the CNCF, right? Cloud Native Compute, uh, sorry, Cloud Native Compute Foundation. There we go. Showed you the demo already. Kind of have some charts here to talk about the memory and footprint. You'll see this on the website, though, so we don't need to spend a lot of time there. You guys saw it kind of live in action, how fast it starts. But let's get to this point. What if you could be 10 times smaller and 100 times faster with your Java-based application? Does that change the game for you, especially as you think about this new world where I'm building microservices, I'm practicing CI, CD, I'm using Linux containers, and I want to scale out fast, I want to respond to load. You don't have to uh, scale. You don't have to actually have to provision for peak any longer. You know, most of your users show up at your application, your API, your website at a certain time in the week. They show up on Monday morning at 9 a.m. local time. Or they show up because all the New York traders came online. Or they show up because you have a huge office in China and Beijing just came online. Things of that nature. So you only have to scale. You can dynamically scale as needed. So it's just the beginning for Quarkus and what you're going to be seeing going forward. So it's no longer the end here. This will give you, you guys have access to the uh, slide deck. The Bitly Keynote Quarkus will get you to the slide deck, or you can follow me on Twitter. I obviously don't have time in this setting to uh, you know, receive questions, but I'll be available after the session. Thank you so much for your time. And did you guys like what you saw?